North East um, region and um, just thank everyone for attending the call and hope everyone's safe and well. Um, I'm going to hand you over to, um, to Dr Nagman Khan and his colleague Darren Lynch uh, um, give us a bit of an overview of everything building physics. Um, so um, I think the, the plan is that if anyone's got any questions, if you can use the chat function um, to add your question on and then um, we'll pick up all the questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Nagman Khan from SimScale. Uh, thank you so much to SIPSI Northeast for organizing this event. I hope you can hear me uh, okay and you can all see the slides. If there's any issues, please uh, use the chat function and uh, either Philip or Julian will, uh, will let us know. Um, so very pleased to be here to talk about simulating thermal comfort and the outdoor environment. Uh, I'm joined by my colleague Darren Lynch and what we're going to do is uh, uh, give you a bit of background about our southern sim scales very quickly and then jump in to the presentation. Darren, are you there? I am, yes. Fantastic. Let's let's crack on to the uh, introductory slides. No problem. Yep. Uh, so my name is Agman Khan. I'm, uh, I've got a background in simulation. I'm a physicist uh, and I'm here at SimScale uh, for the last year and a half working on um, uh, kind of uh, the, the, the physics of simulation for outdoor and indoor environment. And more, more recently, Darren and I have been looking at um, uh, simulating windows, ventilation, uh, you know, the impact it might have on virus transmission. And we want to share some preliminary results with you, as well as tell you a bit more about uh, some of the other capabilities in SimScale. Darren? Thanks very much. Um, yes, and my name's Darren Lynch. I'm an application engineer here at SimScale. Um, my background's actually in aerospace, um, specialising in CFD um, side of things. I've actually been at SimScale for about three years now and lately um, working with Dagman in the AEC industry doing both external aerodynamic, building aerodynamics and also um, thermal comfort type simulations as well. Um, so I would describe myself as a typical user of SimScale and of course um, the technical point of contact going forwards. Thank you, Darren. Let's have a look at the agenda. This is me, by the way, Nikman, here in the bottom corner. Um, uh, let, so very quickly about SimScale. So SimScale, uh, if you don't know, we've created the world's first cloud-based engineering simulation platform. And we specialize in fluid dynamics, soil mechanics, thermodynamics, all accessed via a web browser. Darren, next. Uh, so what we're going to do is quickly tell you a bit more about cloud simulation. What, what does that actually mean to simulate on the cloud and through a web browser? And my colleague Darren is going to show you a live, uh, a very quick live demo of the platform. It's very important and it'll make sense later when we talk about internal and external simulation. And then we're going to jump into thermal comfort and ventilation modeling and then take a quick look at building aerodynamics and wind comfort. And then we can uh, have some questions and, and keep your questions coming uh, and uh, we'll, we'll get through them, hopefully all of them by the end. Thank you. Darren, why don't you tell us a bit more about cloud simulation and show us a bit, show us the SimScale platform. Sure, let me just change my screen. There we go. So yeah, um, this is of course um, SimScale. What we, what we mean by a cloud-based simulation platform is actually that it runs in any web browser. So what we've got here is SimScale just running in Google Chrome, nothing special. Um, you can access this from wherever you are in the world on whatever computer you wish to um, use. You don't need any um, kind of local installation of any special software. You don't need any large computers to run any of these complicated simulations. Um, all you need is this web browser. So SimScale, um, we spent quite a lot of time um, making this user friendly. So um, we're, we're really taking this um, building physics, this simulation platform and making it easy for you guys. And in terms of the user experience, it's very similar across the board. So whether you're doing external building aerodynamics or indoors thermal comfort, we've got this same kind of um, user experience where we have a, um, a viewer, we call it, in the center here. So this is where you interact with your model, your results. You might make some assignments to boundaries. And on the left-hand side here, this is where we actually import geometries, where we set, um, set up simulations, et cetera. But of course, um, when it actually comes to um, setting up simulations, we've also um, done a lot of work here. So we've actually, um, for example, spent a lot of time on the pedestrian wind comfort side of things, where we've made this into three very simple steps so that you can um, reproduce results as quickly as possible. So um, 
without further ado, what I'm going to do is walk you through this um, application example. Um, now, this application example is actually a, a small part of the city. Um, the city is actually Bristol. And if I actually show you where that is, it's um, just to the north of Castle Park in um, Bristol. And you can see here, it's this building block here that we're most interested in. And we've got some very recognisable features here, particularly this um, round pedestrian region, and also this tall building, which you can um, see in this geometry here. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to take you through um, setting up this simulation from scratch, which is only going to take about two minutes, um, if I don't talk too much, and then show you the results and the outputs that you get from that. OK. So the first thing we might do is import geometry. Um, it's, it's important to note that we do support most geometry formats, including the STL file format, which you can get out of almost any of your software packages, such as Revit, Rhino, and um, also software packages like IES as well. Good. So once we've imported the geometry, we're going to create a simulation. And I'm actually going to do this straight from the beginning. I'm going to create a new simulation, and I'm going to create a new pedestrian wind comfort analysis. And um, by default, we get um, a geometry selected. So I'm actually going to select the first one. And there's only three main steps, as I mentioned, and that is um, where in the world are we? Of course, we're in Bristol, so we're going to um, we're going to type that in. We're going to identify whereabouts in this geometry we're actually interested in, and we're also going to say where the pedestrians are actually standing. So um, you can see here on the left hand side, we've got the pedestrian wind comfort analysis type appeared. We're going to work our way from top to bottom. So the reach of interest is actually denoted by this, uh, this circular zone. I'm actually going to change the radius to 150 and I'm going to recenter it on zero. Good. Um, there's actually um, not anything else to do here. So we've, we've identified this as the region of interest, but more specifically, um, this is the region we're going to be looking at later, this little courtyard area. Next up, what we're actually going to do is we're going to say, where in the world are we? Um, it's quite simple. You type in the location, um, in this case, Bristol in the UK, UK, and we can import web data through our connected service, Meteor Blue. And we automatically import that data. And for demonstration purposes, I'm just going to show you um, how to set up a four direction analysis type there. Good. No more needs to be done there. And the only other thing is to say where people are actually going to be standing in this um, in this area. So people might be standing on this surface here. They might also be standing, um, say, on this bridge, for example, or um, next to this road or up these ramps. That's the uh, the general workflow. You just select everything a pedestrian is actually standing on and you assign it to a pedestrian comfort map there. You could also at this point choose how high pedestrians are going to be um, measured for comfort at. So typically we use 1.5 meters, which is approximately neck height, but you can um, go higher or lower if you wish. And it might surprise you to note that this is actually all you need to do to start a simulation. Um, you've got a lot more control and um, ability to do many other advanced things, such as modeling the trees and um, modeling different surfaces, um, even exporting some unique um, results. But actually, um, in terms of a good starting point, uh, we can start simulation from here. And I'm going to do that. And what it does is it actually gives a sanity, sanity check on the simulation setup. Um, you can see here that I've left something as default, I'm going to actually say that's absolutely fine. I'm going to run anyway. So that's that's the workflow to setting up a simulation. But what I'm actually going to show you is what do you actually get out of this simulation type? So I'm going to go back to a simulation that I did earlier and I'm going to load up what we call the statistic surface solution, which is a long word for saying um, the pedestrian comfort results that we're we're looking at. Now, what we do is we actually solve um, a simulation for every single direction, wind direction. We also look at the, um, the wind statistics and generate this comfort map from both of those. And the kind of outputs that we get are um, this color map that identifies what is comfortable and what isn't comfortable for various activities. So in this example, we might say that we're looking at putting a um, a restaurant in this area, we might be outdoors dining. Um, in this case, we're actually comfortable to do that. So we can actually sit outside comfortably um, for the majority of the year and be um, satisfied in that location. In contrast, what we might not be able to do is have a pedestrian crossing in this area because we can see that this is suitable for only for business walking. 
And if someone was standing there waiting for the lights to turn green, for example, then they, they would be uncomfortable at that position. And this is how we kind of identify regions that might not be comfortable. Now, I'm going to um, leave the demonstration there. Um, I haven't covered everything, of course, but um, I'm going to just point out that um, we have, of course, got um, support for the platform. And this is very important because we're a cloud based simulation um, platform. Whenever you need help or need support, we have also got chat function down here on the bottom right. So if you've got a question about boundary condition, how you might actually sell that simulation or you need pointing at a certain piece of documentation, then of course you can contact us um, straight through that um, area there. Good. So I'm going to change back to the slides, Dagman. Yeah. Uh, Darren, uh, I think the good thing is that you talked a lot and you still did it in two minutes. <laughs> so, but it was a good demonstration of how, you know, basic three steps to set up and run a simulation. And, and this is really important because uh, I, I think when people think CFD, they, they think, uh, you know, historically CFD has always been, you know, uh, complex, niche, difficult, expensive. Uh, and, and that's that's all true. That that is, uh, you know, a lot of people when they when they think of CFD, that's what they think. So SimScale, we what we've tried to do is, um, uh, you know, put it on the cloud, put it on a web browser, put a nice interface around it, and uh, make it really easy to use, while still having the power for the advanced CFD user there. But definitely trying to make it accessible uh, to a wider audience. I mean, we have architects, for example, using this now for very early stage concept stage uh, studies. Um, Darren, maybe mention a little bit about the community plan and then we can jump into the rest of the slides. Yeah, sure. So the community plan is a initiative which allows you to um, get basic access to the SimScale platform. Um, you can actually log on for a free account. Um, you've got a certain amount of um, allowance and there's um, s some simulation types that you get access to, including the indoors thermal comfort type analysis types that you can use. Um, just to kind of get a feel for the, um, the simulation software tool, um, and just how easy it actually is. Um, and of course, everyone is um, welcome to sign up for one of those accounts. Yeah, and Philip, to your question, yes, all, all the weather data is included in, in everything as well. Uh, great, okay, let's talk a little bit about thermal comfort and ventilation <clears throat> modeling then. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please, Darren. Just next one after this. Yes, please, yeah. So, um, uh, sorry, one back. Oh, okay. Might be a lag. This one. Okay, we're good. So uh, let's talk about thermal comfort and indoor environment. So, so SimScale has a couple of solvers, physics solvers, integrated into the platform, right? We have Open Foam as well, which is a very heavily validated uh, CFD, uh, <clears throat> CFD code and solver that's been around for a long time. We have that lattice bottom method, <clears throat> which is uh, primarily used for external modeling. So some of the some of the results Darren was showing just now that was based on the LBM method. Um, and certainly for the indoor environment, um, you know, lends itself really well to using open foam here in SimScale. These are kind of the typical applications people use SimScale for. So things like natural mechanical ventilation, right? Thermal comfort, compliance and standards, indoor air quality, contamination spread, smoke propagation. And these are all things you can do in SimScale. So you have these kind of full height spaces, you know, modeling atria, uh, thermal stratification, we have a lot of people using SimScale to model classrooms, uh, you know, classroom ventilation, CO2, um, uh, for looking at the impact of cold drafts. You know, uh, if you have roof mounted ventilators or air coming in through a window at varying temperature, what, what is the impact on thermal comfort within a space from a CFD perspective? So it's, it's, it's important to understand um, SimScale is not a thermal modeling tool, right? Um, so just very quickly before we move on, you know, we're familiar with thermal modeling tools like, you know, IES, TAS, Design Builder. These are fantastic tools, right? SimScale is a CFD tool. So what we do is focus a lot more on the subzonal level. So whereas one of the thermal modeling tools might give you the temperature in a space or the average temperature in a room, uh, SimScale, because be being CFD, uh, will give you the distribution of that temperature within that three-dimensional space. Likewise, with airflow, with a thermal modeling tool, you might use it to model natural ventilation to see the flow rate in a room depending with different opening or supply strategies. SimScale being a CFD tool, we can show you the distribution of air in that space. And obviously, it's a, it's a fully-fledged CFD tool. It's very advanced, lots of different turbulence models, advanced meshing uh, capabilities in there. 
So what we wanted to show you was a, a, a recent piece of work that Darren and I have been doing. Darren, next one. Sure. Uh, specifically on ventilation modeling. So th this came about, you know, it's interesting times, uh, you know, with, with, with COVID-19 and various other things, a lot more emphasis on the, the indoor space when it comes to transmission of viruses, germs, et cetera. And uh, we're getting asked a lot more now to show <clears throat> how CFD can be used to do that. So we, we, we're helping some of our uh, clients do this, but we also set up our internal test models. Um, and what we've done is we've set up this uh, room, I guess it's it, uh, a, a building uh, you can see here, it's got a, a, this particular instance has 16 people in it. Uh, it's got windows on both sides on two of the facades. And uh, we've got four uh, diffusers, which can be used as supply or extract. The windows can open in various uh, configurations and uh, different different setups and uh, you know we put all the normal internal gains in heat gains from people equipment lighting etc there's infiltration there uh, there's a solar gain applied to uh, to the windows and we're just modeling in detail the, the the CFD aspect of the airflow distribution so the great thing about uh, simulating on the cloud is you can model things in parallel so let's say this model you had I don't know you defined 12 different configurations of window openings. What you could do is set that up and hit simulate and all 12 would simulate in parallel. So it's a huge time saving, right? If you think about, you know, if anyone who's used <coughs> CFD in the past, uh, CFD simulations can take a long time. You know, imagine doing 12 in a row, one after the other. Uh, so the great thing about parallel simulation is it's a huge time saving uh, as well. And obviously it's great for, you know, uh, actually getting to the solution faster. So we, we've done a very simple workflow here, importing the CAD model, we've defined the boundary conditions, uh, and we've hit simulate. So Darren, let's take a look in the next slide, what kind of results we're getting. So there's kind of the outputs you can get here on the room level are things like, uh, you know, air changes per hour, mean age of air at various points, and comparing those scenarios. So you can see here, uh, this legend here is, um, is the passive scalar for the mean age of air and um, we've simulated this and what we've done internally is simulate dozens of different scenarios right to compare what is the difference you know if you if you have a top hung window you open it you know five degrees eight degrees ten degrees twelve degrees in different increments and you have another window open on the opposite side or you have a supply diffuser and an extract diffuser or a combination of the two you know what, what's happening to the air the velocity, the air distribution in the room, plus also the temperature distribution in the room as well. So this is really easy. L let's take a look at some of the more uh, granular results. Darren, great. So here we can see uh, we can see the visualize the air distribution in the room. So we're looking at air velocity and temperature here, and these uh, kind of streamlines that you know you can put them in any plane you want. You can define them wherever you want. You can you can look at the whole room. But this is really interesting. I think what we found here when comparing what uh, opening another window does, for example, to the room airflow pattern, is really interesting where someone's sitting and breathing in space. And you know, in this example, people are seated. It's very easy to do it when they're standing or you know, in a corridor. You know, it can be any kind of room setup you want. But small changes, this is very important, small changes in the window opening strategy or any opening strategy, right? It could be any opening strategy make a very big difference to the distribution and flow of air in the room and you know having this granular level of uh, capability obviously it's been an eye-opener for us as well uh, so darren you know we found some really interesting results at desk level as well uh which were really which were really important here and um again like i said you know you might have 20 different scenarios imagine a refurb or a retrofit right and uh, you're changing the, the the windows or the uh HVAC supply and you want this kind of analysis you know you could do dozens of different scenarios very quickly Dan, let's look at the next slide sure this is a uh th so this is the temperature distribution on a horizontal plane uh and we're looking at the working height temperature distribution here um uh we can also output thermal comfort parameters and what we've done is vary the supply and ambient temperature as well. So what's the temperature of the supply air coming in through the windows and diffusers and the ambient temperature outside. We also set the CO2 per occupant as well, uh, based on various metabolic rates, uh, taking them from various SIPC or ASHRAE publications and um, uh, vary the heat gains and also looking at 
drafts uh, and gusts. This 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 type of analysis becomes really interesting when you start comparing scenarios. Also, at an early stage, you know, when you're before you even get to defining a you know what type of windows you're going to have, uh, you know, how big the windows need to be, on what facade are they going on? You know, are you going for a cross flow approach? You know, with the stack effect, the chimney, some kind of you know roof turret for ventilation. Uh, it's really great to have the capability to assess these various various scenarios. Darren, next slide. This is a, this is a great example of that. So uh, we have two scenarios here. Again, same same model. Uh, the only difference is that in one of the models, the window was slightly open by about uh, I think it was about five degrees. Um, and we've simulated multiple scenarios here. And comparing the two options, you can see the difference, right? So very quickly. So if you look at the bottom one, uh, quite a simple uh, flow distribution pattern. Now you look at the top one, you've got these high spots in red. Uh, Darren, if you could just highlight them with your mouse, that'd be great, thank you. Yeah, uh, so you can see Darren's mouse there highlighting uh, the, the streams in red. And this is velocity, by the way, of the air. Uh, and if you look at the top right as well, where you get the uh, the high velocities in the, in the corner spaces as well. Now, obviously, you know, this this might not be a classroom. This could be a restaurant, right? It could be an office. Um, so this is very important where you're sitting, people, where, where you're doing the layout of the tables uh, and the seating spaces. So this is really, again, it's really critical. And obviously, if you move the table, it will impact the airflow a little bit. So what I'm looking at here is, um, you know, th this middle area here, we can see in the top one uh, with the high red, uh, with the, with the high wind, uh, sorry, the high air speeds, um, you know, it's quite close to uh, these occupants. So. I think just being able to ask these questions and answer them is really important. So you can see in the summary points there, again, just comparing multiple scenarios. And we, we've actually done this um, for dozens of scenarios. And this link, the third bullet point there, where it says CFD for ventilation design, this is a very recent uh, thought piece article that we've written. It's available on the SimScale blog. And you can use this link as well uh, to get to it. This gives a more detailed <coughs> breakdown of the reason for doing this type of analysis. And actually, we've taken uh, information uh, from NAFEMS, uh, NAFEMS, which is the, you know, the big CFD ventilation body, on the risk factors for indoor spaces for people, things like proximity, exposure, uh, duration, contact, uh, and I think there's six parameters, and how CFD can be used to assess those various parameters. So please do have a look at this link. Um, where you can see in more detail the purpose of doing this and the benefits of a, uh, I guess, a parametric kind of simulation approach um, using CFD, which is possible because of the cloud. Uh, you know, without the cloud, without the power of the cloud and the parallel simulation capabilities, these kinds of, you know, exploring multiple design answers, they would be totally cost prohibitive and time prohibitive. I, I don't think on any project it would be feasible, or on rather on most projects it would be feasible to do analysis like this. Please um, correct me if I'm wrong and share your opinions as well. Use the chat function. Interesting to hear your uh, opinions as well. Um, Darren, is there anything you want to <clears throat> you want to add on this modeling? Darren, you actually did the modeling product of this as well. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Um, no, I don't think so. I think it's very interesting, obviously, with the window open that we can see quite a nice um, cross breeze happening there. But um, yeah, I'm looking forward to the, um, the rest of the analysis where we can um, draw some really good conclusions. Yeah, great. We, uh, we have a question from uh, Ruth. Yes, you'll get the uh, video and slides, uh, Ruth, of this presentation afterwards, and uh, Philip and Julian will arrange that for you. And uh, the link is in there, or I'll, I'll share the link with the organisers, and you know uh, they can share it as well. Otherwise, it's on the SimScale website or, um, under the blog section. Um, we have a question from Ellie. Ellie, we're coming on to the external section in a bit, uh, so we can cover your questions there shortly. Okay, fantastic. Should we yeah. crack on? Uh, I think there's a couple of things left <coughs> here. Uh, and again, we were talking about thermal comfort parameters. We have these built into SimScale as standard uh, output. So PMV and the next slide is, I think, PPD. Um, so these are already in. So when you're doing this type of modeling for different window scenarios or different um, ventilation scenarios, obviously, you, you know, the thermal comfort is key here. So these are already built into SimScale, so they're very easy to do. One other thing that's really important, Darren and I wanted to touch on quickly, is wind pressure coefficients. Okay, and um, it's Darren's favourite subject, <laughs> and 
Uh, we, you, you may have seen us talk about this in uh, recent other events and webinars. The reason I want to bring it up quickly is this is super important, right? The reason it's super important now is a lot of people are doing some kind of modeling now because of COVID, right? Or they're trying to model the indoor space because, you know, to, to give a better understanding of uh, risks related to COVID-19 and generally virus transmissions and ventilation and air quality, and this is becoming a lot more prominent. And there's a reliance on uh, our industry, that our, in, our standard approach in industry is using thermal uh, modeling tools, right, or energy modeling tools. But like I said, they're great tools. Wind pressure coefficients are so important in the energy modeling tools, right? So if you're using a dynamic simulation tool like RES or TAS or Design Builder or you know any other one, uh, do pay attention to the wind pressure coefficient and how that is used, okay? So this is basically just saying that most of those tools, they don't obviously calculate or simulate wind pressure coefficient, right? Because not, they're not designed to do that. They're not CFD type tools. What they do is they, they have lookup tables for standard kind of wind pressure coefficients and they will, uh, they will extrapolate and interpolate that onto your building type, right? Using standard kind of CP values, CP being the wind pressure coefficient. But the wind pressure coefficient basically determines the delta P between the inside and outside of the building, right? So all air exchange between the outside and inside is uh, related to the wind, this wind pressure coefficient value here. So therefore this impacts you, all your fresh air and air exchanges. It has an impact on the heating and cooling loads and hence energy and obviously it impacts thermal comfort. <laughs> Next slide, please, Aaron. And the thermal modeling tools, they don't account for these points. So wind turbulence, external wind conditions, uh, local building context, you know, surrounding buildings, basically, terrain, uh, various exposure types, right? So you have to really understand if if you're going to model, uh, do, do some kind of detailed ventilation modeling for your building, there's a few little things you really have to know or at the very least you have to know the impact of not including a more uh, detailed assessment of wind pressure conditions. Next slide please Darren. So in SimScale what we've done is uh, we've taken a building and we've modeled we've simulated 16 wind directions again in parallel and we've extracted the wind pressure coefficient so CFD generated wind pressure coefficients right next slide. And what we've done is import that into the thermal modeling software. Okay, in this case, um, it was RES, but it, the, the same the same process and uh, principle applies to all the other tools. So we've used CFD generated tools in SimScale, an easy to use software on the CFD software on the cloud. Again, using the setup Darren showed earlier, you know, three four steps. It takes just a few minutes to set this up and run it. Extracted the wind pressure coefficients, thrown that into the thermal modeling software. Next slide. And this is this is what we get, right? Um, so on the x-axis here is the wind pressure coefficient, and on the y-axis it's the height up of the opening about uh, across the building at the height of the building, right? Now, um, typical CP values are these black squares. So this these black squares are wind pressure coefficients from thermal modeling software. The blue line is the wind pressure coefficients generated from SimScale. And you can see there's a massive difference. There's a, a huge difference in magnitude, first of all, of 100%. More importantly, on the sign, positive or negative. So what that means is if you're just doing a standard kind of analysis where you're trying to design a ventilation strategy and you have an opening on a facade, you know, your, your thermal modeling software might be telling you actually there's a, wind, there's a positive wind pressure coefficient there. And you might think air is going in to your window there, right, in terms of your ventilation strategy. But that's not the case. Right. Actually, it will. It might have a negative pressure coefficient, and air might actually be being extracted from that window, from that facade. Right. And again, these are things that thermal modeling tools do not pick up. So you have to be very, very careful how, if you're giving people advice on ventilation, you know, window configurations, HVAC supply, different types of strategies, especially, especially when it comes to things like schools, um, healthcare, hospitals. Please be super careful of how you're doing the simulation in there, right? Um, and talk to the talk to the thermal modeling tools, the software vendors. Then you know, ask their advice. Talk to us. We're happy to talk about things, 
right? There's lots of different ways to doing it which make it more accurate. So this is a great example of where CFD is complementary to the thermal modeling tools. Next slide, Darren. Great, Let, let's talk about building aerodynamics uh, quickly and then we can start taking some more questions. Darren, why don't you, you've already shown this in the live demo, but maybe yeah, re re reiterate this uh, and yeah. then we'll start looking at some building aerodynamics. Yeah, no problem. So as I mentioned in the demo, it is a simple two minute setup process. Um, three main steps. Um, define the region, so that is this uh, this circular zone that we're actually defining. This defines actually um, whereabouts in the whole model that we've uploaded we are interested in. The second step is to define the windrows, and you saw that it was actually as simple as just typing in the location and importing the weather data. You can, of course, upload um, your own weather data if you so wish, um, but it is much simpler if you um, use our data if you're happy with that. And finally, um, defining where the pedestrians are actually standing. So this could be on the on the ground, on the street level, or alternatively, you might be interested in a multi-storey type application with um, different heights, different terraces, different um, balconies um, in which pedestrians might be standing or doing activities on. And you can, of course, select all of these independently. Um, and then you're good to start running your simulations. You can, of course, do many other things, but um, that is that is the two minute setup um, that you need at its core. Carry on, Darren. Show us some some outputs of the next few slides, please. No worries. So, as you saw in the um, in the presentation in the demo, you can of course get um, pedestrian wind comfort results, but that's not you know it's, it's not all that you get out of that simulation. You can of course get um, many different uh, types of data, including 3D slices, which you see on screen here. What we're actually looking at here is we can see um, maybe downwash and certainly the wake of the, the main building here and also where you're getting high velocities traveling between those two buildings as well. Uh, moving on to the next slide, we can start looking at um, different effects that is um, maybe going to be detrimental to things like um, pedestrian wind comfort. Um, and this is um, starting with um, corner acceleration. So as we get sharp edges on the buildings, we're going to get um, the flow moving around the buildings, speeding up. And actually, this is compounding um, if we actually have some downdraft in that building as well. And obviously, the more the more effect this corner acceleration has, the, the worse the pedestrian comfort is at that um, corner of the building. Moving on then, um, another effect we might see from these results is actually the channeling effect. So this is when two buildings either converge or are close together, where we're going to get um, flow essentially speeding up going between the two buildings. And of course, this um, this also has a detrimental effect to pedestrian wind comfort. And finally, um, or shall I say, the last one that we're going to be looking at is the, um, the downwash effect. Um, the downwash effect is one of my favorites. Um, very interesting. Of course, it's um, it's made worse the taller the buildings. So if you if you're constructing a, site, a skyscraper in in the middle of a generally quite flat environment, you're going to get some very um, high downwash effects, where essentially you're drawing high velocity air from high up in the um, atmospheric boundary layer and you're bringing it down to pedestrian level. And it's it's when it starts rotating at pedestrian level and coming down all the way to street level, that's when we're going to get the um, the detrimental effects to pedestrian wind comfort there. Good. Um, of course, that is just pedestrian wind comfort. That's not the only thing we can do. We can use this um, very fast workflow to get other results, such as um, wind loading and facade pressures. Um, so everything we discussed previously with um, pressure coefficients, we can, of course, generate in this workflow. Um, in the screen slide um, we've got here, we've got um, a few different things. We've got the front side pressure coefficients where we've got the, the high pressures on the front, um, but also on the sides we've got maybe fluctuations, but low pressures on the sides and low pressures at the back and to the right of this particular building. Um, and we can draw this data in many different ways. We've got it graphically here, but you could also um, plot this over time. You can plot this um, from every point, and this is very handy because if we wanted to pull that data for thermal modeling, so getting the pressure coefficients, we can um, pull a list of points as well. A, a great point about uh, data, Darren. So you can also download all the quantitative data from SimScale. So if you want to do your own analysis on that, on you know some other uh, results kind of um, package or Excel or some kind of spreadsheet analysis, you can you can do that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
so wind comfort results, um, as I mentioned in the demo, I think um, this is a combination of all of the velocity or the speed results from each individual direction that we've solved, brought in in combination with the weather data. And what it's done is it's actually analysed um, certain criteria to say what a person would be comfortable doing and where. And there's lots of different types of um, comfort criteria available to us. And the one we use in the UK typically is Lawson criteria. We, for other parts of the world, we have also got the Davenport and the NEN 8100 um, criteria as well. Um, and we've also got generally quite a few varieties of each of these as well. Um, so I think that answers one of the questions in the in the chat of what comfort criteria we use. Yes, we do have Lawson, but we've also got a few different iterations of Lawson criteria as well. Good. So, um, sorry, no, man. No, yeah, car carry on. Yeah, of course. Um, in terms of results, um, not only do we get this um, statistical result, we also get the uh, velocity results for every single direction that we've solved. But uh, in addition to that, we uh, we actually solve a transient simulation for every single one of these. So we, we use um, what we call a hybrid turbulence model. Um, it's a combination of RANS and LES. So what we're actually getting is um, quite high fidelity results, uh, which enables us to actually um, show transient results. And this is what we're showing on screen here for zero degrees, 90 degrees and 270 degrees. Um, so not only can we actually identify the average um, velocities here, but we can also look at some some areas where you might actually get some um, gusts um, and quite quite influential turbulence as well. Yeah, exactly. And if you have a uh, city with a very strong prevailing wind direction, you might just pick one wind direction to begin with, you know, especially for the early stage designs before you go into any of the detailed uh, stuff. Dan, it's a good time to take some of the questions from Ellie, actually, course, yeah. because uh, some of them are very relevant. And I think we, we should frame it in the context of LBM. So, mm -hmm. um, so, we, we, so, so we'll come on to trees in a second. Because uh, we've got a slide on that next, but uh, in, Darren, tell us a bit about the LBM method and why it's so <laughs> robust, bringing different types of geometry in, right? And also then touch on the 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 the, the benefits of LBM in terms of speed and stuff. I think this answers a lot of questions. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think typically uh, we're we're much different from the what we would traditionally use in CFD, which is the finite volume method. So we're using the lattice Boltzmann method for our external buildings um, solver. Now, as, as you said, it is much more robust. What we're actually doing is we generate a lattice um, which represents the, um, the computational domain. And instead of um, snapping this um, mesh in, in traditional terms um, to the geometry, what we're actually doing is we, we, um, we have a series of collisions from a particle point um, to, um, to a wall. Now, what this actually means in practical terms is that we can actually upload geometry that is not closed, not necessarily of high quality. Um, there might be small gaps, there might be interferences in um, the mesh. Uh, it could have a plethora of different problems, but actually what we expect from the solver is it to just solve anyway. So this is um, typically quite a blessing for those who have um, pain points in CAD preparation. Um, we can actually upload a, a geometry and just expect it to solve. Um, but naturally, I do um, do encourage you to do visual and sanity checks to the um, geometry just to make sure that you haven't got any dramatically open regions that are going to affect results. So um, take it with a, a little caution, I'd say. Um, and Nagman, I think you're on mute. Yeah, I, I was saying you don't have to spend two weeks cleaning up your Revit geometry. <laughs> so mm -hmm. you, can, you can just bring that in and it can accept geometry with, you know, holes and gaps and intersections and various other things because of the fact that it uses the lattice Boltzmann method. So it, it doesn't need to be a watertight geometry. Each volume doesn't have to be a, you know, a closed space. And this is fantastic. You know, architects love this. Engineers mm -hmm. love this. Um, uh, Darren, so, yeah, go on. Yeah, so I, I was just going to talk about the, the speed of the solver. Yeah. Um, quite interestingly, um, we don't use CPUs for the um, the solving of the lattice Boltzmann method. What we actually use is GPUs. Um, so by doing this, what we actually do is um, we, we've essentially got a lot more computing power. We can split the job down into many, many smaller parts um, and solve a lot more in parallel, which means that the compute times of this kind of analysis comes down from days or weeks to actually a, a matter of hours in most cases. 
Um, and of course, this allows us to get um, with, with solving all the directions in parallel as well. Um, it, it allows us to get these comfort results in probably um, a couple of hours, depending on how many um, how many scenarios that you're running. Yeah, and, that, and that's critical. I mean, so what Darren is saying is a transient analysis, an unsteady analysis on a, on a model this large, you know, like a, a part of a city or a town, you know, a few hundred meter radius, uh, to model, you know, 16 wind directions or, or, you know, 12 wind directions or whatever, is taking a couple of hours as opposed to, you know, three days. And I th th this is really important. This is because of the left spotting method. This is because it uses GPUs and this is because it's on the cloud. So th these are really important points to be able to understand, uh, to be able to understand this. Um, Darren, there was a question on, um, yeah, um, turbulence. How is turbulence model? You touched on it earlier. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe just give a summary uh, for everyone. Sure. So um, I think in, in general terms, traditionally we have been using RANS um, type um, turbulence models in these types of analysis. Um, Although we, we know that the large eddy simulation gives us much better results, what we've actually gone for is a blend of the two. So um, in the lattice box method, obviously every single cell is um, is cubic. Um, th there's no no large aspect ratios. So what we do is we employ a, um, a wall model um, at the building walls, the floor walls, etc., to um, improve the accuracy there. So we actually use the K Omega SST wall model. But we, we've got a hybrid model that then um, transitions to large edge simulation in the far field, which means we get the best of both worlds. Um, and this also reduced the computational effort required um, in that sense as well. And we have uh, we have tons of validation studies on our website uh, about the LBM solver, like tons. It's been validated heavily against other CFD codes, against wind tunnel studies by multiple universities and research institutes around the world. Again, that's all on the website. OK, <clears throat> let's move on. Did you want to talk about yeah, something? Yeah, we, we also have uh, the, the new City of London wind microclimate guidelines built into SimScale. So I, if anyone's looked at these guidelines, um, uh, you know, they're, they're really good. It's the first of its kind where they've been very explicit and prescriptive of how they want modeling done. And, you know, it, it talks about modeling up to 36 wind directions in parallel and various other constants and parameters. So it's already built in into kind of like a navigator style tool in SimScale. So SimScale will give you all the outputs uh, like that. And again, we're seeing a lot more of this now. Various The, the, the biggest cities and municipalities are coming out with their own standards. The City of London actually released their the outdoor comfort um, uh, guidelines just recently as well. So that they're definitely far ahead, but we're seeing other cities, not just cities in the UK, but municipalities globally trying to do this as well. And again, these kind of things is very easy to do in SimScale. Darren, I think the next one is on trees and vegetation. Uh, so just getting back to the question from Ellie, there's a porous media feature in uh, SimScale and you can use it to define and set up trees, uh, not just trees, but vegetation, you know, wind screens. These are really important for mitigation uh, in high winds if you're trying to achieve a certain comfort criteria around corners, different types of canopies. Streetscape is becoming really important as well, but also the impact of comfort on cyclists. Again, really important. So we have a various common tree species built into SimScale, or you can you can define your own as well. And now we have a lot of people using it to kind of define urban urban greening strategies. You know, after after the whole COVID thing, a lot more areas are trying to become more pedestrianized, whereas first they were made for motors and vehicles. So you know that you know just just, just making an area for pedestrians all of a sudden doesn't necessarily mean it's you know it's safe for pedestrians, right? So a tool like this is very good. For assessing, um, you know, comfort for pedestrians, for cyclists, for other types of users as well. And again, that's built into SimScale. Okay, I think Dan is anything else to add from your side? Uh, no, only the simplicity of this process. Um, you literally can just select a tree, and then from a drop-down list, select what species of tree that you actually want to assign. So, uh, I think how can you um, model trees and vegetation? super easily and from a drop down list in most cases. Fantastic. Next slide, please, Aaron. So I think that's it from us in terms of the presentation. I'm going to hand back to the chair 
uh, Philip, uh, for any discussion or further questions, but do take a look at uh, the, the video and the resources we send around. And like I said, we're happy any time to discuss your, your simulating modeling capabilities. Um, uh, so just key takeaways. So indoor internal modeling, you know, it's very easy to do set up scenarios and multiple room configurations with various, you know, mechanical or naturally ventilated um, uh, strategies and outdoor environment, uh, super easy using the lattice bonsword method to run, you know, wind comfort, building aerodynamics studies using SimScale. Philip, I'm going to hand back to you. Yeah, lovely. Thank you very much for that. That was um, very interesting. Um, just, uh, I think there's, there's maybe just been a, another, another question just appeared on on the chat there um, in regarding to importing of um, town maps. Oh yes, yeah, I see it. Uh, okay, so Darren, there's a question about importing town map uh, data. Uh, how to do it, basically, what, you know, for a larger scale, I guess, not just on the building level. Yeah, I mean, t town maps in terms of a 2D data set would um, would need to be uh, converted to a 3D um, geometry and then uploaded to the SimScale platform. Yeah. Yeah. Is, you, is that right? Yeah, I think so. And adjacent buildings, you can you can import um, um, models from third party tools, you know, like um, mm. City, CAD Mapper. If you if you're using a third party uh, CAD data tool, that's easy to bring into SimScale as well. Uh, now, on just another point, which I think you might have mentioned before, um, were you offering a, a sort of a, a trial for using the software? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, so the, there's two ways to do it. We we have a community plan which Darren mentioned, which is a free version of SimScale although it has uh, slightly more limited capabilities than everything we've shown here, but that's a great way to get started for it. But the whole, all the capabilities for indoor modeling, external modeling, as we've shown you now, that's available on a, on a free trial. So uh, if you get in touch with us, we can, we can help you kind of set that up and get going with it. And we also have lots of free uh, videos and tutorials on, on how to get started. Great. I, th I think you were saying you, you're going to share the, the presentation with us so we can share it via social media with, you know, with, with the rest of the, the region and further. So um, I'm sure yeah. there's details on your, your website and so on of exactly how to, you know, how to, how to use that. Um, I think there was an, another question just come up off, off Ellie there as well. Yeah, I've seen it. Great question, Ellie. So a really interesting topic uh, for us at SimScale. So uh, one thing that I should have mentioned uh, is well, SimScale have released an API right and uh it's an application programming interface and what it means is in simple terms that you can uh use third-party tools to connect to the SimScale engine so recently what we've done in fact darren was involved in this project is uh use grasshopper to control SimScale. right so um we we've been able to uh you know for outdoor comfort like things like utci and you know various outdoor comfort criteria um use grasshopper environment you know with ladybug honeybee and various other ones but call the SimScale API, use SimScale to do the system wind direction CFD analysis to contribute to the overall um, outdoor comfort criteria. So, so that's uh, absolutely possible. And uh, we've got lots of examples and use cases of how the API can be used to connect to other types of tools and different types of simulation capabilities. If there's anything very specific, uh, please do get in touch. My email's on, uh, on the slide there, and kind of simscale.com, and we can, um, we can talk further. Uh, uh, Darren, I think uh, just uh, there's a question from Ruth about, you know, the answer previously about converting to 3D. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, generally what you would be uploading to SimScale is a 3D geometry format. So um, if you've only got a 2D um, topography map with buildings, say, dotted around, you would need to extrude the various buildings into three dimensions and also um, create the the topology in three dimensions to actually be able to use it with the um with the simulation tool um typically i do this in in uh, rhino so um i would import the 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 map i would do my extrusions i would draw my contours at the right heights etc and um, do the loft in between all and that's how i would um, build that type of geometry alternatively of course as dangra said there's a lot of other providers out there including um some free tools so there is um um, CAD Mapper, which is a essentially a mapper for open streets, open source um, street maps. That does um, topology and buildings, so you don't actually have to do that work yourself. Um, 
Also, there's um, very good high detailed services such as View City and AccuCities that all do this um, modelling for you. So all you'd actually need to do is place the building of interest within that um, context that they provide you. Sorry, Darren, um, or, um, would you mind them, them, them free software tools that you just mentioned there, would you just be able to add them on the chat? Um, of course, so yes. People can pick them up at a, a later date. Um, be quite useful, I think. Yep, no problem. Um, excellent. Now I just opened up for, for any more questions, if anyone's got any. 